and welcome to this webinar produced by Corel. It's an honor to be here and talking about my favorite software program. In this webinar, I'm going to tell you some of my secrets for turning photos into paintings in Corel Painter. This webinar will be a taste of the many art lessons, tips and techniques to create great paintings in Corel Painter that I show in all of my books, videos, and classes. So for the next 40 minutes or so, I'll talk about three general topics. The art of painting, a look at how photographers can use art theories to enhance their paintings based on photos. Off to a good start, an overview of various ways to start the painting that you can use right away based on photos. And in the thick of it, how to use Corel Painter's thick paint and glazing brushes to paint portrait backgrounds. So first, I thought we would take a look in, at an overview of art theories. So speaking of art theories, many times photographers want to ignore art theories and just want to know what brushes to use to get a certain effect. But actually, you'll get further with painting knowing art theories than you will knowing every tool in painter. Using, and I want to just add to that, that uh, I think that's one of the, the things that confuses people about painter. They think that they need to know every single tool there is. And the more tools they know, the better they'll be a painter. And the fact is, is that the more they know about art theories, the better they're going to be a painter. Using art theories as your guide makes the painting become less frustrating. When you have basic guidelines to follow, you have an idea of what you want to accomplish, like using GPS to get somewhere. Ignoring art theory is like ignoring directions. It's like getting in the car and driving around aimlessly, hoping to get somewhere. As you look at these traditional paintings, you see one of the main differences between a photo and a painting. That is that a painting has a chosen color scheme, while photographs have random color schemes. And repeating the colors in your chosen color scheme throughout the painting is called color harmony. If you use color schemes and color harmony in your paintings based on photos, they'll look more painterly like these great master paintings. There are several ways to choose color schemes. If you happen to live near galleries and museums, it's always a good idea to go check out real paintings and see what the brush strokes look like in person. And then it gives you an idea of what you're trying to do with your paintings and the other thing is is if you're not near an urban center and you're not near galleries and museums many of the world's museums have available now to visitors digitized versions of their paintings high resolution so it's very interesting the metropolitan museum of art in new york lets you look at all of their paintings online at high res and you can actually zoom up on old master works and see all of the brush strokes. It's really fantastic. So I highly recommend doing that if you are interested in painting and painter to see where it is that art has come from. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at various ways to start off the painting based on a photo. And here we are in painter. I'm going to open up a photograph by Linda Gregory. So this is a photograph by Linda Gregory and this is the painting I painted based on it. And you can see that I added my own colors within a chosen color scheme but I kept the look of the painting, uh, the photograph, and the way that I painted this is, I'm going to choose the photograph. I used the method, the, the first method that I use all the time, and that is to choose File, Clone. And what File Clone does is it creates a copy of the photograph with computer mapping back to the original. And this computer mapping lets you use painters painting tools, including the cloner brushes and tracing paper. And I'll show you what that means. Here in the, this is the final painting, I can turn on tracing paper and I can see what the photograph looks like for reference and paint in the painting. And I'll give you my little description of what tracing paper is, because people, if you have any experience with Painter, 
tracing paper seems to be the most confusing concept to everybody but about what's going on because the reason that it's confusing is is tracing paper you think that it's a piece of paper that's going over the image and you're tracing the image but in fact a great way to think of tracing paper is to think of it as a projection onto the image so think of the the painting as a, some canvas hanging on the wall and the photograph is a projection from a projector so when the projector is turned on you see the photograph and this is with tracing paper turned on and when you shut off the, the projector the tracing paper is turned off so tracing paper was like a nice um sort of a catch-all kind of a term and it's been in painter almost since day one it's been in painter since day two you want to hear a funny story about tracing paper um i wrote the first manual for painter and so i supposedly knew the program inside and out because i just written the manual for it and i was invited to macworld this is in 1991 to help to demonstrate painter along with the original programmers and uh, so i got to the, we actually had Painter set up in the Wacom booth. Uh, it, it was This was before Corel had Painter. It was called Fractal Design Painter. And Fractal Design did not have their own booth. We used the, the, the Wacom booth. And um, so I got there a little early and I saw the, one of the inventors demonstrating Painter. And I figured, well, I'd, I'd watch him. And since I'd never demonstrated software before, I thought I'd watch him for a little while and just see what he did. And then go ahead and do my thing when it was my turn. Well, he was demonstrating something in Painter that I had never seen in my life, which I had just finished writing the manual for for a year. And it was tracing paper. And it was something that he had programmed in his hotel room the night before, because somebody said, you know, it'd be really cool. It'd be really cool if you could trace a photograph in a <laughs> in the software. So he said, yeah, you know, that'd be a cool idea. So he actually programmed it in his hotel room the night before and it was added to Painter the next day. Things were done very quickly, I'm sure Tanya thinks that's funny because I'm sure there's a very long development cycle nowadays with Painter, but back then they sort of did things, the expression is it turned on a dime. So he, the programmer was told the night before the debut, yeah, this would be cool and he programmed it in and that was the first time I saw tracing paper. So that's an aside. Getting back to using tracing paper, so I now describe to you how it works and so when I turn on tracing paper, I can use the photograph for reference as I paint in the painting. So, and uh, I also wanted to show you real quickly just an example of that. So this is, this is the clone that I created. Here's another thing that always confuses everybody. Uh, in the finished painting, when I go to turn on tracing paper, you see the photograph very clearly. But when you first start out after going file clone, and I'll go back to that untitled image, that's the new clone that I created. Of course, when you go to turn on tracing paper, nothing happens. And that always confuses everybody until they realize the reason nothing happens is because the information in the painting clone is identical to what's in the photograph because we haven't done anything yet. And I'll show you what I mean. But if I go in, what I start to do in this particular instance, I'm going to paint right on the photograph in the clone and use it as an underpainting for the painting. I'm going to go into one of my favorite all time painter tools. It's in blenders and it's just add water. And I'm just going to start to paint right on the photograph in the clone and what I'm doing is is I'm eliminating details and that's another art theory paintings have less detail than photographs and so if you eliminate the detail the painting will look it'll look more painterly and then the idea then is you then paint back suggestions of details so I do always start out by or not always but in this case I'm starting out by blending because I'm blending out details and the Just Add Water is an incredible blending tool. And now when I go to turn on tracing paper, you'll see, you'll see the photograph. So that's with tracing paper shut off and that's with tracing paper turned on. And 
you know, I can't finish a whole painting in a, in a few minutes. It takes a few hours to a few days. But that, I want to show you, that's the start of it. And the more that I painted, the, this was the result. So that's the first way to start off a painting based on a photograph. That's to go file clone. The second way to start off a painting based on a photograph is to use a, another tool that people always ask me about. And I'm going to open up a photograph that I use the second tool to paint. And this is a photograph that I took. Um, I want to give credit to Kat Meesen. It was in her studio. I didn't set up the lighting, but I did, ta I did take the photograph. And this is the painting I painted based on it, which is the one that you see in the welcome screen. And this was painted using a second method for starting off the painting. And that is using file quick clone. And if I were to rate the times I get questions, which questions come up the most often? The first one is, why, why, how is tracing paper working? That's the first question. People are always confused by tracing paper. And then the second question is always, what's the difference between quick clone and clone? So I'll tell you the difference and I'll show you how it works. Oops, I hit quick clone by mistake. I didn't mean to do it, but there it is. And uh, I'm gonna shut this, I'm gonna do it again more slowly. Okay, so here is a source photograph, and I'm going to choose File, Quick Clone. And what this does is, first of all, it does the same thing as File, Clone. It creates a copy of the original with computer mapping back to the original so that tracing paper and cloner brushes can be used. What else this does is Quick Clone is kind of an automated file clone uh, and it takes care of some more uh, steps for you. So what it did was it actually deleted what's in the clone. Remember when we just did file clone, we actually had the photograph was still in the clone. But this has deleted the 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 photograph from the clone and it has turned on tracing paper for us and I, I was using the shortcut key for tracing paper before I'll, I'll go into the menu I'm going to go into canvas and I'm going to shut off tracing paper so I have a blank canvas actually and painter did that for us so again if remember what I said if I go canvas tracing paper it's like turning on a projection of the photograph onto the, onto the painting. And a use for this method to, add, to completely delete what is in the, the source photo is to really start painting from scratch. And that's how I did this painting. Okay. <laughs> So the way that I painted this painting is, I'll get back my, my clone image. And I used, I actually, I create a lot of brushes and I have my own brushes that I like. And I used, I created a couple of volumes of old world brushes. So I'm gonna choose one of my brushes. And I like this, this first one. And I, what I do is, is I go edit fill and I have a color chosen that's sort of the mid-tone of my color scheme. And in the color panel, sorry, it's uh, hidden by the webinar stuff. Here it is. Okay, with light and dark tones of my color scheme, I'll add 
brush strokes to create my background. And again, this takes more than a couple of minutes. This, this can take hours. But that's how I created the background that you see in this painting. And then what I'll do is I'll choose a cloner brush. One of my favorite cloner brushes is in a different brush library. In Here in the brush, brushes libraries, there's a pop-up menu up here next to the words brush library. And if you click and hold up here, which you may or may not have discovered, you have all of the past versions of painter brushes in here. And I have a fondness for the Painter 2015 brushes. I'm going to choose 20, Painter 2015. And I like in the cloner brush category, I like the Camel Oil Cloner variant. So tracing paper is turned off. Here it is turned on. And I'm going to paint with a cloner brush and I'm going to bring in the image. And if you move the reset slider in, this is called the property bar up here. If you move the reset slider over to the left, you get a more painterly effect as you bring the photo in. And I'm going to shut off tracing paper so you can see my progress. So this is another way of turning a photo into a painting in Painter by creating, uh, by going file a quick clone, painting in the background, and then painting in the figure with a cloner brush. Or you don't even have to use a cloner brush. A lot of times I like to just paint freehand. I'll, I'm still here in the 2015 brushes and I'll choose a square chalk and I'll choose a color. I'm going to zoom up on here. Command plus on Mac, Control plus on Windows. Press the space bar, click and drag to go to the part that I'm painting. And I'm going to hold down Option on Mac, Alt on Windows, and pick up a color. And right now I'm going Option, Command, and click and drag on Mac. And that's Alt, Control, click and drag on Windows to resize. And I'll paint, and I'm now I'm painting freehand using the photograph as my guide. So I don't always use the cloner brushes. I like to paint freehand. Or you can use a combination. Once I get in some colors like that, I can go back into the cloners and add some detail. I'll move the reset slider up and paint more detail. So I do, I, I like to use a combination of freehand and cloners and painterly cloners and detail cloners. And the more that you paint, the more it gets filled in. And this was the result. I also used my own color scheme. And again, that's just a taste of how to do it. You know, there it's all of my tutorials and classes and such and my books all have the step-by-step -step process, but this gives you a taste of how it's done. Then there's a third way that I always start off by turning photos into paintings. And I'll show you how the third way works. And I'll show you, this is the most recent painting that I have done. This is the finished painting. And this is based on a photograph, the figures are from a photograph by Richie Schwartz and the flowers are from a, a photograph by me. And I'll show you the source photos. So there are the flowers that I photographed. This is the photograph that Richie created. What I did here was I used this clone source panel. 
and remember we went file clone and file quick clone so we had a clone source so that when we turned on tracing paper the clone source appeared well as it turns out you don't have to just stick to one clone source you can have multiple clone sources in painter so this is what i did i established the the photograph as one clone source, the figures as one clone source, and I established the flowers as a second clone source. And then when I went to paint in the image, here in the clone source panel, you see that these two, these two images are, are listed in the clone source panel. So if I choose the figures, if I turn on tracing paper, we see the, the figure photograph. And if I click on the flower source, we see that the flowers are the source. So that's very cool because then that means that you can paint in the painting. I did, I used another one of my brushes. I have some flower brushes. I also have some dog brushes. I guess I'll choose a dog brush. Uh, let's see. And I'll choose this brush over here. I'll paint on the dog. So I can turn on tracing paper and see what the photograph looks like. And then I can paint with a brush. and then turn on tracing paper and see my progress. I like to have tracing paper on at 100%. Here in the clone source panel, you can also, uh, you, can, you can have the opacity at like 50% so that you can see the photograph while you're painting. But I like to put it on 100% so that I can see the photograph at 100% or else shut it off 100%. And so that, that shows me what, where I'm going. But if I want to paint the flowers, because they're in a different image, I, if I choose the flower source in the clone source panel, now the flowers come up and I can paint them. And use the, the tracing paper for reference. So that's a third way to turn photos into paintings in Painter. You know, if you think about it, in you can do this in Photoshop, you would just put the flowers on one layer and the girl and the dog on another layer, but then you're you're messing around with with layers and it just gets really complicated. This is this seems to me more simple to be able to control the the reference through the tracing paper instead of having to deal with layers. So that's the third way. That's a, a third way of how to start turning a photo into a painting in Curl Painter. And um, we have a little time left. I just wanted to show you some ways of working with the thick paint and the glazing brushes. And I'm going to go back to my Colette painting for that. Her name was Colette, that's why I call it my Colette paint. This kid's probably in college by now. I did paint that a long time ago. Uh, actually, the um, painting, I'm, I'm not, I don't, it's not really true. I, it's actually a new painting that I just painted, but I took the photograph a long time ago. So there are art theories for painting most things. And that includes backgrounds. And I use art theories to help me decide how to paint the background. And one of the things, one of the art theories is, is you want the subject to be the, the focal point or area of greatest contrast between light and dark. And what that means is you want the subject, which in this case is the person, to be either lighter 
or darker than the background. So I keep that in mind. I keep the tones in mind as I paint. And so in this case, I made the background darker than the figure. And so when I paint with the brushes, I use darker tones. And I'm going to choose the thick paint brushes. Now I'm still in Painter 2015 and they're in Painter 2019. So I'm gonna, the way that I revealed the brush libraries again was to click on the brush selector. And then there's this pop-up menu up here. So I'm gonna click and hold where it says Painter 2015 and scroll down to Painter 2019. And I missed because I'm talking and doing at the same time. So we'll try it again. And I'll use the mouse this time. There we go. And I'll choose the thick paint brush category. And the first brush I'll show you is the grainy oils jitter. And whenever I choose a brush in Painter, the first thing I do is I click the reset tool, which is this brush icon up here in the property bar, which brings all of the original settings back because I don't know what I did the previous time I used it. And I'm going to option on Mac, Alt on Windows, click on a dark color in the background and I'll just start painting. And so I like this kind of textured look that comes in with this brush. Then I go into the grainy, real oil bristle flat. And I think that's one of the things that I hear all the time that people say, oh, there are so many choices, I don't know which brushes to use. So what I like to do, and what I always recommend to people is, is I actually go through every single brush and I test them out to see what they do. And if I find one I like, I write it down. So I have been through every single one of these brushes. And so these are the things that I found that I like. So the second one is the grainy oils jitter. And I find that this is good for sort of, oh, sorry. I just painted with that and I'm, I'm looking at this, I'm saying, why does that look the same? Because I just painted with it. The next one is grainy real oil, grainy real bristle oils flat is the next one that I want to show you. And as I started to say, this kind of blends what I just did with the first one. So I like that result. I'm going to make the brush a little wider. So it starts to have a nice thick paint look. The third one that I like is the Real Bristle Trail Off. This also has a nice thick look. Notice what, what's happening is this. If I paint where I already painted, it actually levels the thick paint. Try a different color. But if I paint where I haven't painted yet, it adds thickness. So that's an interesting aspect of it too. And it, I mean, it starts to really look like paint. So those are the, the three favorite ones that I like in thick paint. And then last but not least, let's look at the glazing brushes. So I'll edit the background with the glazing brushes. And the first one I'm going to use is Dynamic Spreckle or Speckle, not Spreckle. What's interesting about the glazing brushes is that they will paint with transparency so you can see the underlying imagery. So I'll paint these flowers with the glazing brushes and it's a way to edit tones. And one, and one of the art concepts that guide you is, is actually how to edit tones. Just like I said before about the background that the, you want the background to either be lighter or darker than the person. There are a lot of things like that about tones that add to the painterly nature of the painting. So for instance, I see here 
if I turn, I just turned on tracing paper because I wanted to see what the tones were, not the colors, but the tones. And in fact, in the photograph, you see that there are some dark tones at the bottoms of the petals. And if I turn on, turn off tracing paper, you see that that's how I, in fact, painted the painting. I put some dark tones at the bottom of the petals. Well, I can continue to do that here with the glazing brush. And if I just paint over this, notice that it's not opaque. It lets the underlying imagery show through. So it's a very nice way to add some tone without changing, without covering up what I've already painted. See, that's a good example right there. You see how it's darkening what's already there and then where it gets lighter, it's, it's also getting lighter. So it really is following what's already in the image and it's very, it's a nice way to work. And the last brush I'll show you for this session and we'll then we'll open up for questions is the particle gravity. And you can also use this to add tones. And if I use this color, notice what's happening. Can you see that? Um, undo that. If I option click on this color, alt click on windows and paint, it's bringing in that color, but it's also letting the darker tone next to it show through. So it really is a way to add tonal variation without covering up what's there already. So it's a nice subtle way to add tone. So that's a taste of the glazing brushes. And that's a taste of Corel Painter. And I can wrap this up and, and we can, you can ask your questions. I'm ready to answer questions if anybody has any. Okay, great, Karen, we do have questions. This goes way back to the beginning of the presentation, um, but Helen had asked, and I don't know the name of the painting, but how long did it take to paint finished 029? <laughs> well, all of them take anywhere from two days to two weeks and okay. it's i've gotten a little bit better it's not as often that it takes two weeks but i haven't for some reason i haven't been able to get it quicker than two days um people like to think that i do them in two hours and i have never i don't know maybe it's because it's my the way that i do them my final result is just has more, uh, it's just more work intensive, but uh, it really does. It takes me two full days usually, and those are like 10 to 12 hour days. I'm really, I don't know why. I, don't, I, I, I guess I do know why. I guess just like even sitting here doing this little glazing, I, I was enthralled looking at it, all the, the nuance and the subtlety, and I do, I... I think I get lost in painter, so maybe that's why it takes me so long. Um, but it isn't, a, you know, to get a really good result, it's not a quick process because you're not, because as we know, it's not a filter. You're painting everything by hand. So that's the long answer to the short question. Okay. And as we discussed yesterday, and there's more and more questions coming in right now. So everybody, I'm going to try to address all of these, but everybody is very interested in um, from the time that you start your canvas what is the optimal size that you create if you have the intention of printing okay um it's a good question i know that people don't really aren't really they aren't really familiar with it and here's the thing to remember when you're going to print um, you want to create the size of the painting that's going to be the final print. In other words, it goes back to the beginning photograph that you're going to go, that you're going to clone. You want the photograph to be your final dimensions. And so um, people get these done in all different sizes. The, I guess the most common start at 16 by 20. You don't want to go smaller than 16 by 20 because you really lose the brush strokes. And then they go up to, they go 20, 24 by 30 is a, is a popular size. 30 by 40 is very popular. There are photographers who are selling four foot by six foot paintings. I have never painted that big. 
the usual paintings that I paint are this. I really don't even paint 16 by 20 so much. It's usually 24 by 30 and 30 by 40. In any case, uh, you need to make your source photo that size at 300 DPI, which is the common printing resolution. Now, a lot of people say you don't need 300, you can get away with 240, it doesn't matter. Um, I've always used 300 just because it's the generally accepted dimensional size. And here's another secret. Um, I just got a new iMac and so I don't even know, like maybe if you have a current machine, it doesn't matter so much, but I'm very used to working on older equipment. So I was told by a printer many moons ago that a, a great way to work on painter paintings is actually to work half size and then double the size at the end in Photoshop. Not to do it in Painter because Painter isn't equipped to actually do the interpolation. It really is better to do it in Photoshop. But um, so for instance, if you're gonna paint a 20, a 30 by 40 painting, uh, that's, I mean, it's gonna print out eventually 30 by 40, you wanna paint it at 15 by 20 or half size and then you can double it at the end and you won't lose any detail if you do that. So, and you, that again would start with the, the photograph originally and then when you go file clone, you'll be at the right size for the painting. Okay, fantastic. Um, another question that Carol had, and you kind of just addressed that, but not entirely, is do you recommend printing from the painter riff or should you use a Photoshop file you just said why you may want to go to Photoshop if you want to upsize the image, but do you have a preference for what type of file you print from? It depends if you're going to be printing it yourself or if you're going to be sending it out to a lab or a printmaker because most printmakers and labs do not have Painter, so they're not going to be able to open up a RIF file. And so you do definitely want to save it as a, a Photoshop readable file if you're going to send it out. If you're going to print it yourself, and if you have your, you know, if you have your your computer set up with your printer, and then you can use a RIF file. But if you're going to send it out, you have to do it with a Photoshop friendly file. And um, I always save the final file as JPEG. You don't want to save, you don't want to work in JPEG and you don't want to repeatedly save in JPEG because it does ruin the file. It does, the compression for JPEG does take away pixels. But if you work, if you, if you just save once at the end into JPEG, it's still going to be fine for printing. And um, the other thing that I'm always asked is, is why would you use the RIF file format and it's because if you're just going to work in Painter, the RIF file format saves things like the clone source and so in other words if you have, if you do what I demonstrated, you go file clone and you save the clone and so you have the clone and its clone source, if you save that clone in the RIF file format and you shut down Painter, go to lunch and come back and relaunch it, when you go to open up that painting, it will know where the clone source is because you saved in the RIF file format. You would save in the PSD and TIFF file formats if you're going to take the file into Photoshop to work on it for any reason. Also, if you're going to work with layers, you want to save in the PSD file format, because if you save in the TIFF file format, when you open it in Photoshop, there won't be any layers. So, but if you're not going to work in Photoshop at all, it's I always work in the RIF file format in Painter because it saves all of the Painter goodies, like clone sources. Okay. Um, oh wow, there's a lot more questions coming in, so I'm going to do my best here. Um, one of the early on questions from Joanne was. And there are general questions. How do you get parent brushes? And do you have any brushes for creating lace? Um, you can get my brushes, thank you for that question, at my website. And I'll show you. This is my website and I have these are uh, my commission paintings galleries, so you can get a look at all of my different styles. And then here in the learn to paint menu is where all of my instructional stuff is. And here is the 
link for artistry brushes. And then in the link, this is an overview. And this is a directory to all the brushes that I have so far. And I do have um, some examples of what other people have painted. And I do have uh, videos of every single brush uh, volume that I've created to show you what every single brush is in it before you buy them. And I also have uh, bundles if you want to buy a bunch of brushes at the same time. And the question was, how do you paint lace? Well, you know, it's very interesting. That is one of those things that really your that art lessons helps with. And I'll show you an example. I have my galleries organized by um, most photorealistic, which is the Windsor Gallery, to the most painterly, which is the Barcelona Gallery and everything in between. And so this is the Windsor Gallery. And this was a commissioned portrait that I painted for a photographer. And um, there is a lot of lace on that dress. And the way that I painted it was by hand and by brushstroke by brushstroke. And the secret to painting lace is the secret to painting everything. And that is everything is areas of light and dark. And the more that you paint areas of light and dark, the more it's going to resemble what you're trying to paint. So that's the answer to how to paint water, how to paint uh, skies, how to paint eyes. It's all painting areas of light and dark. So I did, I painted, I wonder, it would be too hard to find this file right now. I don't, I don't have it handy, but uh, so I can't show you a close up of it, but um, that's all it is. It's in other words, if you paint areas of light and dark, they combine to look like what the object that you're trying to paint. Okay, great. Um, some other questions just relate to color, choosing color, what color space are you using, RGB or sRGB. Um, so to break it down, um, I think first I'll ask, do you, well, what is your what color space are you using and what tablet? Okay, um, as far as color space goes, it's um, I'm kind of um, a non-techie when it comes to Photoshop. And um, I have always just painted in Painter and then I bring it into Photoshop and turn it into a JPEG and send it out to the printer. So I have never actually researched or understood the different color spaces. So I use whatever the default is. So okay. sorry about that. Yes. Pay no attention to the girl behind the curtain. Everyone <laughs> always thinks I'm like this real tech nerd. And I actually, if I, I only know how to paint. I don't know anything else. And um, I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? What Waka or I know oh, you're the Waka, yeah. Um, which one are you using? Yeah, I've, I've always had an Intuos Pro Medium, and I also have a, a Wacom Cintiq Companion 2. Um, the, the question always comes up in the Facebook groups, what size Wacom is the best, and I recommend medium. It's, I've always worked with the, uh, in fact, that's how I'm sitting here right now, I've always worked with the Wacom on my lap. I find that's the most comfortable, and so it's it's always that's where I've always used the medium for that. Um, and I always am asked, what's the difference between Intuos Pro and the Bamboo? The Intuos Pro has more levels of pressure sensitivity, and if you haven't ever had a, a Wacom tablet, it's okay to get a Bamboo. It's still better than having a mouse, but if you're going to do any serious painting, you are going to notice a difference if you get the Intuos Pro, which has more levels of, sense, of pressure sensitivity. Then another Wacom that I have is this, this Companion 2. And what it is, is it's a, a tablet and a computer combined, which I absolutely love because instead of having to lug a laptop and a Wacom tablet wherever I go, I can just bring the Companion 2 and it's all combined into one thing. Now they have discontinued the Companion 2, but I think if you go up to their website, I think they have a section for uh, computer, pen computers. 
So I think that's where you would get that kind of a thing. And, you know, Wacom is, their customer service is very uh, good. If you have any questions, you can always just contact them and they'll help you figure out what to get.